The focus on this chapter is really how to identify interest rate risk, quantify interest rate risk, and manage interest rate risk. And we're going to do this uh, using the concepts of duration and convexity. And so that really will be our focus in this slide deck. Let's go ahead and look at the learning objectives here. We'll start out briefly with a description of some interest rate factors that are going to determine, you know, kind of the general level of interest rates. We'll look at this concept of a DV01. I'll tell you about that in just a second, but primarily what we're going to do is we're going to define, compute, and interpret things like effective duration and convexity. We'll talk a little bit about negative convexity, and then we'll end with a brief discussion on barbells and bullets. So let's go ahead and start with that very first learning objective. Let's go back to our previous chapter where we talked about the yield curve, right? Let me just remind you, yield curve is a picture of the relationship between time to maturity on the horizontal axis and yield to maturity on the vertical axis. And the interesting thing about that relationship is that that's the yield curve. It can be either upward sloping or downward sloping. Remember we said something like, hey, yield curve, when economies are expected to expand, has an upward slope to the curve. The question then becomes, what are those rates? What are those yields all along the horizontal axis? Boy, we could call them spot rates from last chapter. We could call them forward rates from last chapter. I think in this chapter we're just going to generally call them yield to maturity, but the idea is what happens, what happens over time to the yields on individual bonds that mature at those specific maturity dates. And what this chapter does is tell us that there are three primary factors that are going to influence the level of interest rates influence the yield curve and therefore are going to influence the price of the bond. Now, of course, the first one has to be the central bank. Every country has a central bank that's in charge of things like determining the supply of the currency and setting interest rates. In the United States, this is the, uh, this is the Fed and the way the Fed influences interest rates multiple ways, but one of the ways that they have historically done this is by setting what's known as the federal funds rate. And the federal funds rate is an overnight loan rate that banks charge each other for one day loans. And this has everything to do with reserve requirements. But what happens is the Fed looks at the economy and says something like, you know what, here's the economy, it's this big, and it's growing by this amount, and we think that the federal funds rate ought to be between, let's just pick two numbers, let's say one and a half and two and a half percent. So the Fed sets this target Fed fund rate, Fed funds rate. And then the banks use that Fed, Fed funds rate to charge other banks in this uh, Fed funds market. Now it's a, it's a floating rate, so it can go up and down, but as long as it stays within that target, then the Fed leaves it alone. But once it gets outside of the target, once it gets higher, once it gets lower, then that's gonna have an impact on what the Fed is going to do in terms of raising or lowering those rates. And I mean, here's the thing, when the Fed increases the Fed funds rate or decreases the Fed funds rate, that has repercussions throughout the entire yield curve. And that should make perfect sense if you have a, 20-year bond and those short-term rates are increasing, right? It's an overnight loan, so it's a short-term rate. Then the yield that you charge, that you are requiring on your 20-year bond is going to at least be a little bit affected by the change in that short-term rate. Second factor, of course, is the change in the price level. Federal government announces every so often that the price level has increased by 1.2% or 2.1%. What that tells us is that if you take a market basket of goods and you go shopping one day and you put in there, you know, a computer and a car and some uh, some eggs and uh, and a table and anything else that you buy and you buy all that stuff at the beginning of the year and when you check out, it costs you, let's just say 100, 
And then you do the same shopping at the end of the year or the end of the quarter. You know, they do this uh, uh, multiple times during the year and you check out with that same basket of goods. And, and if it costs you 108, then, then inflation is 8% during, during that time period. And so of course, as a bondholder, as a bondholder, you want protection against the erosion of the purchasing power of your investment. Uh, those of you who have watched some other videos, I give the example of my wife wanting to build a swimming pool in the backyard. You know, let's suppose she wants to build that swimming pool for $15,000 in, in five years. And so I go out and buy a bond today and I know I take the coupons and I reinvest the coupons. Then the bond matures and I have $15,000. Well, if I go to the swimming pool man or woman and say, hey, I want to build that $15,000 swimming pool in my backyard. And that person looks at me and says, what are you talking about? That costs $18,000. Well, then my investment was a waste of time. I mean, not a total waste of time. But you see how important the protection against that purchasing power of the future value of your bond is critical. So we have the Fed, we have inflation, and then we have this other concept of a flight to quality. And this is really a cool one because what it does is it links the fixed income market with all the other markets. You know, here's the deal. Most of us during the course of our lifetimes, at least in our retirement portfolios, are going to have are going to have uh, equity securities in our portfolio. Most of us are going to own mutual funds, uh, you know, during the course of our lifetime portfolio. But let's suppose that there's some kind of an economic event and there is economic stress. I don't want to call it a crisis. Maybe it's a crisis, but you know, clearly when equity prices are falling, nobody that owns equity securities is going to feel good about that particular investment. Well, if that stress is significant enough, what might happen is those people might start selling over in the equity market and taking those proceeds and saying, you know what, I don't like the risk in the equity market. Can I find some place that has less risk? And of course, of course, uh, investors turn to the U.S. Treasury market. So this is a flight to quality. Of course, Treasury securities have zero default risk, can't get any more high quality than that. So what happens? We've got falling equity prices. We take the proceeds of what we sell on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. We go over to the U.S. government securities market and we get in line and we bid up the price. All of us are doing this so the price of these treasury securities rises. And then of course, interest rates fall. So flight to quality and flight away from quality, that has a great impact on interest rates. So remember those three factors. All right, let's go ahead and get into the meat of the chapter. And let's talk about, uh, let's talk about the interest rate risk, right? We own this bond, what do we know? If interest rates go up, our bond price goes down. This is not good news. Interest rates go down, price of our bond goes up. This, of course, is good news. Well, what we need is a measurement of how much that particular bond is going to change in value when the interest rates change. Now, of course, we know that interest rates have volatility. So sometimes they go up a lot and down a lot. Sometimes they go by a little. But what this DV01 tells us is that we're going to measure the dollar change in value of a fixed income security for a one basis point change in interest rates. So a basis point change in interest rate is really kind of the smallest fraction of the, uh, of the change that is kind of measurable. And so look at the second circle point there. Uh, the zero one refers to one basis point that is 0 0.0001, right? Now, I always give my students silly ways to remember these things. And here's another silly way. You can ignore the next 15 seconds of the video if you want. Those of you who have seen my videos know that I'm a gigantic James Bond fan. And so 007007 is not enough here. So you need to add another, you need to add another zero though. So if you're ever confused about what a basis point is in terms of decimals, just take 007 and just, just add another zero in there and change the seven to the one, of course. All right, enough of that silliness. Now the question then becomes, how can we, uh, how can we measure the dollar value of this one basis point change? And uh, boy, all we're gonna do is measure ratios of sensitivity. So look in the numerator, we have the change in the value of the bond, BV, bond value, 
divided by the change in the yield, right? And that's going to be 0 0.0001. It doesn't have to be, but that's what a DV01 means. We, we automatically assume that it's a 1. And then because we have all those decimals to the right, we need to multiply by the 10,000 in the denominator. So let's take a look at just a quick example here. So we've got a zero coupon bond, right? So we're paying no coupons on this bond. Uh, the yield declines from 5% to 4.95%. That's a 1% change, right? So the yield goes down, then the price has to go up. So it goes from 22.45 to 22.87. There's that formula from the previous slide. If we go ahead and do the math, uh, we get 0.84. So what we say, for every 1% change in interest rates, the, dollar, the bond will lose 84 cents. 1% change, uh, I'm sorry, a 0.01% change in interest rates. Oh, I need to correct myself there. The bond will lose 84 cents. So the way that bondholders and in general fixed income security holders view this DV01 is for really, really tiny changes in interest rates. What What is at risk in terms of the value of my portfolio? And of course, of course, there's a negative sign there just to reflect the uh, downward slope. Now the question then becomes, what can we use this to help us manage the risk of our fixed income portfolio? So let me just go back here quickly. You know, this tells us, okay, we know that our portfolio, we're gonna lose 84 cents. Oh, I'm sorry, for this bond, we're gonna lose 84 cents, but for another bond, it might be $1.84 or $2.84 or, or, or $300. I mean, you know, it could be almost, it could be almost any number, right? So the question then becomes, if that number is high enough, then how do we manage this risk? And one way we do this is to hedge. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about hedging before we get into the math of this problem. I always give my students the example of a farmer. Where I teach and where I live, we got lots and lots of farmland all the way around us. So let's suppose that we're a corn farmer. And what are we doing? In the spring, we plant the corn, we put all of our investments, you know, we do the spraying, we do the weeding, we do the harvesting, and we present this corn to the market when the harvest occurs, right? And so what do we want as the farmer? We want to go to the market and we want the price, we want the price of corn to go to rise over that time period so we can sell our corn for lots and lots of dollars, right? Well, just the opposite could happen. We could do all this work and we could go to the corn market and we could see a thousand other farmers with more corn than we have trying to sell it. So the price, instead of being $4 a bushel, is let's say 10 cents a bushel. All that hard work then doesn't pay off. So this sounds like a perfect opportunity for the farmer to find a hedged position. And that's exactly what the farmer is going to do. Now with a farmer, the farmer operates naturally in the spot market. So in order to hedge, the farmer is going to go over to some other market, like the derivative market, like the futures market, the corn futures market, and take the opposite position in that corn futures market. So the farmer is long in the spot, right, because he or she benefits when prices rise. Therefore, the farmer is going to be short in the futures market, benefiting when prices fall. That should make perfect sense. Now, in this example, as the bondholder, what we're going to do is not necessarily operate in two markets, but operate in two different securities by taking two different positions. So what you're going to see is that we're going to own one bond and then we're going to short another bond. So that's generally the hedge. What we're doing is we're essentially betting against ourselves. But we don't know. We don't know the outcome. So the farmer doesn't know whether he or she is going to win in the spot market or lose in the spot market. But what the farmer will know is that whatever happens in the spot market, that position can be offset in the futures market. So whatever gains the farmer would have earned in the spot market will be exactly, exactly offset by the losses in the futures market. So that's the nature of, he of hedging. And so look at that formula there. You get the sense that we're measuring sensitivities between two markets or between two securities. So the hedge ratio there, that's a pretty basic formula. Notice in the numerator, there's the dollar value of the initial position and the dollar value in the hedge position. That should make perfect sense. 
Now what we're trying to do, look at that first, uh, I'm sorry, the second block point, what we're trying to do is secure the future value of our portfolio. The farmer is trying to lock in a selling price of the corn. Here as a bondholder in this example, we're trying to lock in the future value of our position. All right, so here's the example. We have a 20 year bond that has a DV01 of, let me just round and say 18. What we have found is that we've located this 10 year bond. Now, both of them are coupons and both of them pay interest semi-annually. We found this bond that has a DV01 of 11. Let me, let me round there as well. So I want you to think about it this way. Look, the bond that we own has variability that goes like this, 18. The bond that we want to hedge has variability like this. Can you see I did a little bit less there? <laughs> it only has 11. So clearly we need to have more of a position in the 11 bond to offset that extra volatility in the 18 bond that we own. So I sure hope that makes sense. So there's the hedge ratio. So we take the 18 divided by 11, you get 1.59. And so here's the interpretation. The interpretation is that for every $100 that we own in our original 20 year bond, we have to short 159 of the par value of that 10 year bond. And so you see what's happening here. So when interest rates fall, that's really good news for our 20 year bond because the price is gonna go up. But since we shorted the 10 year bond, we're going to lose probably nearly almost that same exact amount. Now, those of you who watched some of my previous videos will, will know this. I always tell my students and I've told you guys before to think about hedging in the following way. Here we own this 20 year bond. So we have this kind of volatility. So think about it in terms of being this much. What we're trying to do is go to our carpentry bench and put this into our vice. And we're going to use this other bond, a short position in this other bond. And we're going to go like this, right? We do this on our vice and we squeeze it and we squeeze it until we get down to the level with which we are comfortable. Now, sometimes we're going to get down to this thing right there. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you there with that clap, but we can get down to zero. It's possible to completely eliminate risk. Now, certain conditions have to hold true regarding getting down to zero risk. In other words, the, the assets have to be the same uh, and the have to be the same in both markets and the timing has to be the same among some other things. Boy, that was a long explanation. I sure hope it was worth it for you guys, but I enjoyed it. All right, remember what I said in the initial slide. What we're really going to do is we're going to talk about two things. We're going to talk about duration. We're going to talk about convexity. What we want to do is we want to measure interest rate risk. And that's what duration does for us. So look at my first block point up there. Duration is a measure of the sensitivity of the price of a fixed income security to a change in interest rates. All right, so let's think about this picture here. We've got, we've got the change in, uh, we've got interest rates along the horizontal axis and we have price along the vertical axis. And of course, this is a downward slope and it curves. I have a graph here just in a minute, but it curves, it's not linear. So we know that when interest rates go up or down, the price is not, the change in price is not perfectly predictable because the relationship is not linear. Now I've mentioned to you guys over all of these videos that back in my doctoral student days that I had a minor in economics. And so I did tons and tons of calculus back in economics, also in my finance classes as well. Uh, but in every economics class, we always took the first derivative. That's going to be duration. We always took the second derivative. That's, that's going to be convexity. And then we did comparative statics and we did all that stuff. And back in 1989 and 1990 and 91, I could do that stuff in my sleep. If I tried to do comparative statics these days, it'd probably give me a migraine headache. All right, so that first formula up there at the top, there's, you know, with some calculus notation, there's, uh, uh, there's, the, uh, there's the formula of the change, right? Change in yield as it changes in the price. But what we want to compute is this thing called effective duration. And this is really how, the formula that we're going to use to give us a really good estimate of, estimate of the duration of a bond. Let me repeat this. Remember, duration is a measure of the sensitivity of the price. It's actually, it's actually a weighted average time to maturity. 
and we're going to see how that works here in just a few seconds. But there's the formula. We've got in the numerator, it's almost the same thing we had in the previous uh, equation, the previous ratio, uh, just a little bit different. What we're going to do is we're going to take the bond value when interest rates fall, and we're going to subtract the bond value when interest rates rise. That's what's in the numerator. And then we're going to divide by 2 times the current bond value uh, times the change in yield. And that's what the effective duration looks like. So you should be asking yourselves the question, all right, what's the relationship between this slide and the slide before? And that's what I have at the bottom there. So the DV01 is equal to the duration of the bond times the 0 0.0001, right? Th triple, not double, and then times the bond value. So let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and work through an example of hedging using duration. All right, we have a portfolio manager who controls 100 million of Canadian dollars par value, zero coupon bonds that mature in five years. All right, so let's make sure you understand this. The duration of a five-year zero coupon bond is going to be five years. But when a bond pays coupons, what the investor can do is reinvest those coupon payments. So essentially, the investor can get that par value back earlier than the five years. So the duration of a coupon paying bond will always be less than its maturity date. But for zero coupon bonds, duration and maturity are the same. All right, this bond has a current yield to maturity of 6%. Now, life is good here. However, however, this portfolio manager is concerned that interest rates are going to rise and the value of that bond portfolio is going to fall. So the portfolio manager says, you know what, I'd rather have a duration of 3.5 years rather than a duration of five years. So the first thing that the portfolio manager could do is say, well, you know what, I'm going to sell I'm going to sell all of my five-year bonds and I'm going to buy three and a half-year bonds. But there's a problem there because there might be tax consequences. There might be, uh, there might be bid and ask spreads. There's always commissions. There's always some kind of transaction cost. And the simplest of all answer is that there might not be a three and a half year zero coupon bond that meets the default risk requirements for the portfolio manager. So, so what's going to happen is that the portfolio manager is going to sell some of his or her $100 million, 100 million Canadian dollars worth of five-year bonds and buy some other bonds. So let's just suppose the manager has found these three-year bonds that he or she likes. Question then becomes, how can we use this new bond to change the duration of our portfolio, right? To reduce it from five to three and a half. Thus, we are reducing our interest rate risk. All right, a couple of steps to do this here. Uh, first thing is to compute the market value of our bonds. So we'll just take that 100 million, multiply it by E raised to the RT. So yield is six and time is five and it's a minus sign in the exponent to show that we're taking present value. So our bonds are currently selling. Can I round to about 74? Then what we need to do is some simple algebra here. Take, take that amount that we had and solve for the market value of the zero coupon bond with that new maturity of three years. So notice so we've got the five out there on the left and then the three somewhere in the middle and on the right hand side of the equal sign, we're forcing them to equal 3.5 because that's the duration of the portfolio that we want. And we're just going to, uh, we're just gonna solve for X. We already know what P is, right? So um, look at the bottom circle point there. So X is equal to 0.75 of P. So if you take 75% of 74 million, you get about 55 million. All right, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to sell 55 million of our five-year bonds, buy 55 million of our uh, three-year bonds, which leads us only with 18 million of our five-year bond. And if you do the math there, right, um, you get a duration of 3.5 years. So do you see how we used all this stuff that we've been talking about here so that we can change 
the interest rate risk of our portfolio using duration. All right, there's our first concept there, duration. So let's move to the second derivative, uh, convexity. There's the picture I told you about. I was drawing it like this. So look, we have yield to maturity on the horizontal axis. We have uh, value of the bond or price of the bond on the vertical axis. And note that it is a curve, right? Well, that brings some huge problems if we're going to say what happens if the yield goes up or down and it moves more than just a little bit, or more than just that DV01. Suppose it goes up by, you know, 100 basis points or 200 basis points. Wow. So notice my first circle point up there. Duration is a good measure of sensitivity to interest rates when small changes in yield occur. But what happens if we have these larger changes in yield? Then we need convexity. Convexity is that second derivative. And notice that this positive convexity goes like this, and it always lies above that tangent line. And by the way, a lot of people say that the slope of that line is duration, but it's actually the dv01. Uh, either way, the farther you get away from that tangent point, you can see the gaps. You can see the gaps between the straight line and the convexity. And that's where duration fails. Duration is really good to predict new prices when interest rates change by small amounts, but it weakens as we go, as we move out away from that dotted line. So there's a formula for the convexity approximation, and it looks a little bit like our formula for duration, for effective duration. We have to make a couple of adjustments, of course, because it's a, uh, because it's a second derivative, but we have those same variables in there. So what I want to do is I want to work through a quick example here. Suppose we have a current bond that has a price of 96.90 and the yield to maturity is 10%. So what I did is I got out my, uh, my financial calculator and I punched in a bunch of numbers and I said, let's suppose that the yield goes up to 10.5%. Okay, there's a 50 basis point change. If it goes up to 10.5%, then the price is going to fall down to 93.90. If the yield goes down to 9.5%, price goes up to 100. So we need those new prices. Now, I did it with my calculator. That was kind of cheating, but uh, we would be better off if we had a gigantic Excel spreadsheet and we could get a little bit more accurate. Um, of course, we could use those spot rates and those forward rates that we did in the last chapter, but that's way beyond what we're doing here inside of this chapter. So let's go ahead and use those two formulas and compute the effective duration and the convexity. And there they are. So in the numerator for duration, you just take the difference between those two new prices, okay? And then divide by two times the current price times the 50 basis points. So there's the 005. I don't think there was ever a 005 in any of the James Bond movies. I know there was a 008, and there was a 009, and a 011. Anyway, you get about uh, 6.29 of an effective duration. So this takes care of the learning objectives that say something like, uh, compute effective duration and convexity, and we've also defined them and we've also interpreted them. All right, so this is a good slide to know. Now, what do I tell you guys regularly? Identify the risks, we've done that, called interest rate risks. Quantify the risks, we've done that with duration and convexity and the DV01, right? And now manage the risk. So let's go ahead and s s use both duration and convexity to come up with a percentage price change. All right, so notice what I have there at the very top. Percentage price change is equal to the duration effect and the convexity effect. So I wanna go back to this picture here. What we're trying to do is we're trying to say, okay, what does the line give us? What does the slope of that line give us? And then what does the curve give us? So we have to add the curve into the slope of the line. I'm not sure if that made any sense. It makes sense to me. Hopefully it makes sense to you after what I've been saying to you guys. Now that duration effect is just going to be a minus because right downward slope minus the duration times the change in the yield plus and it's the plus because the curvature lies above the line uh, whether you're below or above that dotted line and we're going to take one half of the convexity uh, times the change in yield squared the change in yield squared and the one half that's a complete uh, result of the calculus 
Now I want to use I want to use that formula here in just a second, but before I move to the next slide, let's go ahead and address another uh, learning objective quickly. The good news for you guys is that if you're given a scenario under which a portfolio manager has you know two or three or four bonds, you're probably not going to have more than five or six. I mean, you know, it's it's tough to do that on on an exam, but if you're asked to compute portfolio duration and portfolio convexity, these are really easy. So they're just weighted averages. So you just take the weight, you know, that uh, percentage invested in each particular bond and then multiply it by um, the duration of each bond. So that's just a weighted average. So those should be pretty easy calculations for you. All right, so let's swing back to the duration effect and the convexity effect. And I just want to use those numbers that we did before. And if you want to pause the video, you surely can to do the math as well. So what's happening here is we have the 629 times 0 0.005. So that means the duration effect, uh, we're going to have experienced a percentage change in the price of the bond of 3.15%. But the convexity effect, 0 0.0003, that's going to add to it. So the percentage price change is only ab about 3%. So this is important in terms of interpreting and understanding this. You have duration, which is by far, by far the most important of the two effects, right? 3.15. But here's the deal. We, I calculated that convexity of the 20 based on just a relatively small, what was that, 50 basis points? But suppose you put 200 basis points in there. You're, you're going to get more convexity, you know, because it goes, it goes like that or it goes like that. Nevertheless, with a 50 basis point change, what do we know? That, uh, that we're going to lose, we're going to change about 3% times that 96.9, which is the original bond value. And what does that tell us? That if interest rates go up or down by 50 basis points, we're going to lose... Uh, we're going to lose two dollars and ninety-three cents, or three, or three percent. Let me just round three percent of the value of our bond. You see how how much uh, incredible value this information has in our ability to understand and manage interest rate risk. I mean, think about it. using using these two risk metrics, we can now more accurately predict what our future bond values will be. All right, let's talk about negative convexity. But first, let's forget about everything that's written uh, to the left of the graph. And let's forget about the dotted line as well. What I want to do is I want you to look at this look at this relationship here. There's yield to maturity right on the horizontal axis, and there's value or price on the vertical axis. So there is a perfectly positive convex relationship. And what we tend to say is we refer to these as option-free bonds. Bonds can have lots of options embedded in them, like a call feature or a put feature or a convertible feature. In this example, uh, I'll talk about the callable bond here in just a second. But for an option-free bond, notice what's happening here. As we move this way and move up, when interest rates are falling, the convexity effect really, really increases the value of our bond. That's why lots and lots of bond holders, if they expect interest rates to fall. And if they expect interest rates to fall dramatically, they're going to prefer bonds that have lots of convexity. So if the yield falls by a little bit, then the bond price is going to go up by a lot. And that's the nature of convexity. Now, I want you to think about this. Look, as we're going this way and interest rates fall and they're falling, you know, like 6% and 4% and 2%, what is your bond selling for? Maybe it's selling for $1,200, or maybe it's selling for $1,300 based on $1,000 of par value. Wow. Now, you can go to the bond exchange and, and sell your bond for that big price. But let's go ahead and introduce the concept of a callable bond and negative convexity. All right, so let's still forget about what's on the slide. Let me go ahead and tell you about a callable bond. Let me remind you, even though we've talked about this before in previous in uh, previous slide decks, I'm the com company and I'm issuing a callable bond. You guys are my bond holders. All right, so I have, I issue a bond that gives me the right, but not the obligation to force you to sell me those bonds back. All right, 
Now, the interesting part about this is that if I have a bond that has a par value of $1,000, that's all I owe you, legal and binding contract. I promise to pay you interest and I promise to pay you your $1,000 back. You see where I'm going with this, all right? So if your bond has a call feature in it, you know that if interest rates fall enough, I'm gonna call the bond from you and I'm only gonna pay you that $1,000 par value. You're not gonna get that $1,200 or $1,300. No, you're going to have to sacrifice the price appreciation in the event that yields fall. Now that's why when I come to you and say I want to issue, a, issue you guys a callable bond, you say to me, well, wait a minute, Jim, if this is callable, I know that I'm going to have to make a sacrifice if rates fall, so therefore I'm going to charge you a higher yield to maturity on the bond. That's why callable bonds tend to have higher yields and sell for lower prices than option-free bonds. All right, so that's what happens here. We've got a regular old bond, but when, there's the dotted line like this, when that bond is nearing the point where it is called, in other words, the embedded option is becoming near in the money, then the convexity turns negative and we're bumped up with the ceiling. There's no way I'm paying you more than the par value of the bond, right? So that negative convexity is truncated at the par value of the bond. Now in this example here, and, and most cases it works like this, that what the issuer will do is say, you know what, I'll pay you your uh, $100 par value, plus I'll pay you the next coupon payment. That's why I have the 105 and the 107 there. So this is based on par values of 100 uh, on, on the graph. All right, so I owe you 100, I'll give you the 100, plus I'll give you the $5 in the coupon payment, the next coupon payment that I owe you. So your bond, you're never gonna get more than 105 for the bond. So you see why that, that convexity has to turn from positive to negative. Now it should make perfect sense then, in this example that you're giving up, what are you giving up? Just $2, but in my previous example, you're giving up, what, what was that, $200 or $300. And so that's the deal with investing in bonds that have embedded options, especially a callable bond. You know that as the bondholder, you are not going to feel good about getting your bond called because not only are you foregoing that capital appreciation, but, but you also now have to reinvest the proceeds at the lower interest rate. Oh my goodness, this is so much fun. All right, what we're doing here is we're moving onward, but we're also moving backwards to that, uh, to that DV01. All right, so here we, we've got a bond. We have this uh, embedded call option, and the middle row represents the uh, current rate and current price on this bond. So notice what we're told. Prevailing interest rate environment is flat, so the yield curve is flat at 10%. All right, so what did I say in that previous slide or maybe two or three slides ago? Look, what do we have? We've got a bond that has an embedded option. So its value depends on the option-free component of it and the value of the option. And so that's why I divide this into three columns. So we have 10% on the left-hand column. And what we're concerned about is if yields fall down to 998 or they rise up to 1002. In the middle column then I have the prices, current prices the 105 and so if rates fall then the price goes up to 106. If the rates rise the price goes down to 104. I'm leaving out all of the digits after the, uh, the decimal. What's over on the right hand column, this is an important one here, this is the value of the call option. All right, so note in the block point underneath the table, I have determine the DV01 of a comparable option-free bond that has the same maturity and coupon rate as the callable bond. So we're gonna use this equation there. It's a simple one, the circle, the circle equation. The price of a comparable option-free bond is the price of a callable bond plus the price of the call option. So really all we're doing is summing those two columns over there and what we're saying is that, of course, 
Um, I issued the bond with the call feature in it, right? You were willing to pay less for the bond. And so I'm willing to take a lower price from you, right? So you're paying a lower price, which means you're writing the option, you're getting compensated. I'm paying more by allowing you to pay me less, right? Okay, so that's how that works there. So the price of a comparable option-free bond with the orange and the purple is 108 and 110. That should make perfect sense, right? Option free bond should sell for more than the callable bond. And then we can go back to the very beginning and figure out that DV01 of the comparable option free bond. And there's the simple math there. It turns out to be 0.53. Now, there are many, many ways to form a bond portfolio because remember, Remember that you have, you could buy a bond that matures tomorrow, or you could buy a bond that matures in 50 or even 100 years from now. You know, when you go to the New York Stock Exchange, what you're really doing is you're buying an equity portfolio and you could hold on to those securities forever and ever, right? They don't have any maturity dates. The bond market is completely different. You can buy a two year bond or a five year bond or a 25 year bond. So, of course, the choices that you have in terms of maturities is going to give you some more options, some more choices to fulfill the demands of the future value of your portfolio. Think about the uh, building a swimming pool in the backyard for $15,000. And so how can we do this? Well, we can do a barbell portfolio. So with the barbell, I want you to think of Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? He's always lifting weights, right? Is lifting, and so what does he have? A bunch of stuff over here, and a bunch of stuff over here, and the weights they ought to be the same, right? You never see Arnold, you know, uh, bench pressing 500 pounds over here and 15 pounds over here, you know, it would do something like that, right? So, the barbell strategy half the portfolio is made up of long term bonds, half the portfolio is made up of short term bonds. A bullet strategy, on the other hand, is a portfolio that's made of bonds that fall in the intermediate maturity range. And so here's the cool thing. The cool thing is that you can use a barbell strategy to replicate a bullet strategy. You can use short and long-term bonds to produce an intermediate bond portfolio. And you can do this by finding barbells that have identical values and identical durations. Now, why would, why would we do this? Well, well, let's go back and <laughs> extend our conversation. What did I say to you when I was doing this thing about the positive convexity? What do bondholders like? Bondholders, if they expect interest rates to fall, they love to own bonds that have lots of convexity. Well, well, for the same amount of duration risk, the barbell portfolio, right? The Arnold Schwarzenegger portfolio will have greater convexity, all right? Which means that the value will increase more than the value of the bullet when rates rise or fall. So you win, especially when rates fall. But remember, you know, that goes like this. So you win with convexity, whether rates go up or down. But of course, when rates go down, you, you win even more. Let's quickly go through some uh, barbell portfolio advantages, potentially higher yields. When those shorter bonds mature, you have the opportunity to reinvest at the higher rate. Uh, of course, since you got a bunch down here and a bunch out here, there's probably more diversification. And the short-term bonds, they improve the liquidity and flexibility, right? You've got all these short-term bonds, then you can sell them more quickly and probably at a higher price. Now, because you have a bunch of them out here, of course, they're gonna have higher durations and they're gonna have increases in volatility, which means that you could buy high and sell low if you have a liquidity event. If my wife were all of a sudden to say, wait a minute, Jimmy, we need to build that swimming pool in our backyard and we need to do it today. And I'll say something like, boy, I just spent 100 years putting together this barbell portfolio and rates are slightly moving against us. Look at this volatility. I would have to say to her, well, we can build a $9,000 swimming pool in the backyard now. <laughs> uh, oh, and here's the thing from the last, uh, the last slide deck. Remember, we had the flattening and the steepening of the yield curve. 
And so a steepening of the yield curve is going to force the investor to invest the shorter term proceeds in, in those lower yielding short term bonds. Now the bullet advantages, probably more liquid, of course. Um, if you spread out those purchases, you can probably, probably, it says insure there, but you can probably get higher yields when the rates are rising. And then you're gonna build this up uh, gradually. But let's go ahead and worry about when the yield curve flattens that barbell portfolio is going to outperform. And I think that takes us through the uh, learning objectives for this chapter.